starting the recording. Okay, so good morning uh, everyone and uh, good afternoon uh, to people in the East. Uh, so I'm very happy today to uh, welcome uh, Professor Hun Sung Yang uh, in this uh, webinar uh, series on spin tonics, what we call as WTS. So on behalf of uh, my team, uh, Dr. Rajmushan Singh, Mr. Pushpendra Gupta, we welcome you all. And uh, you, you are, I'm very sure that you know uh, Professor Yang uh, for his uh, phenomenal work on synchronics and magnetism. Uh, but nevertheless, as a matter of formality, I have to just give a short introduction about his uh, academic credentials. Uh, so Professor Unsu Yang is a global foundry chair professor in the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering at the National University of Singapore, commonly known as NUS. He is working on various magnetic materials and devices for spintronics applications. He has worked at the uh, Computer and Science Technology, uh, LG Electronics in San Jose, and Intelligent Fiber Optic Systems in California. Uh, he received his doctorate from Stanford University, uh, I think uh, on, uh, with uh, uh, Professor Stuart Parkin and Chris Harris. From 2004 to 2007, he was at IBM Armageddon Research Center. He has authored more than 220 uh, journal articles and have given about 200 invited presentations. He has also about 20 patents to his credit. Uh, he was a recipient of the Outstanding Dissertation Award uh, for 2006 uh, from the American Physical Society. Uh, and uh, recently, in 2019, he has been the uh, distinguished lecturer by the IEEE Magnetic Society. And he has actually got many other awards. So uh, with this very short introduction, I again welcome uh, Professor Hun Sung Yang and sincerely thank him for agreeing and taking the trouble to give this lecture. I'm sure by his lecture, our young researchers will be uh, largely benefited. So I'm really looking forward to a lecture also. Please uh, start. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chairman. Uh, it's my uh, you know great pleasure to give this talk in the, you know in this uh, webinar. Um, so I slightly tweak my uh, title from topological spintronics, you know, topological nonlinear uh, spintronics, uh, to talk about something different because I gave a talk in uh, you know the conference in Delhi like a month ago. So probably some audience you know overlap. Uh, so I want to you know show something different. Um, okay, so this is my content. I'll, I'll talk about what is basically, you know, non-linear, you know, transport in spintronics. So one of the typical example is uh, bilinear magnetoelectric resistance, in short BMR. Right. So this happened in, uh, you know, various topological materials such as uh, topological insulator, bismuth selenide or even two-dimensional electron gas, like uh, strontium titanium oxide uh, you know, interface, or it can even happen in the wire semi-metals like uh, tungsten ditelluride. So then I will move to uh, whole geometry uh, with magnetic field, also you know, non-linear hole transport without magnetic field. Then I will conclude my talk. So as you know, you know, our community, spintronics community, sort of boomed, you know, due to the advance of this uh, GMR, giant magnetic resistance, and then uh, lots of research focused on, you know, spin-dependent scattering or spin-dependent transport, including uh, tunneling magnetic resistance. Recently, this field, uh, spin orbitronics, you know, again, uh, you know, fueled a lot of research interest. And at the same time, not only interesting physics like spin hole, like Lashiba, spin nurse, and so on, we also had a very interesting discovery in terms of uh, quantum materials, like uh, topological materials, you know, wire semi metals, and so on, which you know have uh, spin polarized, uh, you know, uh, band structure. So once you combine those two, you know, then we, we can imagine whether there will be any non-linear effect uh, in, in the transport properties. So that is the topic I want to talk about today and uh, we can refer as non-linear spintronics. So when you talk about non-linear spintronics, what does that mean? 
basically it indicate uh, if you apply electric field, you will have you know charge current accordingly, all right? Um, but there could be you know second order term, so E square term, and which you know typically is not you know existing or often uh, neglected. So that's the main topic I'm going to talk about today. So what is the basically nonlinear phenomena? Is this something new? No. This nonlinear phenomena, you know, has been utilized in our uh, lots of applications in the, you know, RF microwave, you know, applications. And if you look at our, you know, basic uh, electronic component like a PN junction diode, as you can see, you apply the voltage and current, you have very nonlinear response. Transistor also, you know, is a very nonlinear, you know, transport function. So basically, any useful, you know, devices mostly utilize this nonlinear behavior. But then you may think about what is then linear behavior? Linear behavior is particularly useful when you have a sensor. Because when you, you know, measure like a temperature, there must be a linear response. When you measure, you know, velocity, we should have a linear response. So, uh, you know, when it comes to sensor, we prefer to have a linear response. But when you, you know, think about some other applications like, uh, you know, intensity modulation or a switch, on and off type of switch, you know, we want a very nonlinear response. In optics also, you know, this nonlinear phenomena, uh, you know, have been investigated and then widely utilized in our daily life. If you look at, you know, how to make a new color, basically we use, you know, frequency doubling. One of the best example is your green color laser diode, which you, you know, can easily buy in an electronic shop. So basically it convert, you know, from, uh, you know, longer wavelengths and then use a frequency doubling, then convert to this, uh, you know, green color uh, in this cavity. And uh, uh, for example, spectroscopy, you know, even telecommunication, signal processing, uh, basically nonlinear optics, you know, uh, has been used uh, very widely in our life. However, in spintronics, you know, nonlinear transport or nonlinear principle uh, has not been explored much. Um, the the interesting uh, system which can you know give rise this interesting nonlinear transport, uh, uh, non central symmetric, uh, highly spin orbit coupled system, such as uh, topological insulator, you know, which support uh, interesting uh, this uh, surface state. The other one is like Lashba two-dimensional electron gas system, also you know coming from uh, the interface. Also, uh, if you look at this uh, low symmetry crystal like a tungsten ditelluride, we have uh, broken symmetry. Uh, you know, so this is uh, one of the key example of uh, so-called wire semimetals. All right. So, you know, once we have this very interesting uh, spin texture from, uh, you know, various systems, this is one particular example of uh, topological surface state, TSS. Okay. So if you look at um, the spin texture uh, in the K space, you can see the supported spin direction is always orthogonal to the, you know, uh, K direction. So this one we call spin, you know, uh, momentum locking. In reality, this material is uh, doped. So if you, you know, move your Fermi surface away from the Dirac surface, then you can see this hexagonal warped, you know, uh, Fermi surface. And at that point, we start to see this outer plane spin texture, right? So from this uh, hexagonal warped Fermi surface, if we apply uh, magnetic field, then the Fermi surface is distorted depending on you know, the magnetic field direction, then uh, we may see this uh, nonlinear transport. That's our uh, basic motivation. To be more specific, um, you know, consider a very simple you know, Fermi surface, okay? This circular one. You apply electric field into to the right direction, then what happened? We shift our Fermi surface to the right, okay? Then we add, you know, some spins in one side and also we, you know, deplete some spins in the opposite side. So that is basically shown in this F1, distributed function, you know, blue curve. So in one K, you know, there is a sort of, a, you know, negative 
you know, uh, addition, but on, on the other side, you add, uh, you know, more basically, you know, uh, electrons. So this is the typical linear transport picture. If you now take a derivative of this F1, basically F2 is the derivative of F1, and that is basically second order term in transport. And if you look at the response in the Fermi surface, basically now this guy is the squeezed, you know, up and down side in a way. So laterally it expands. And if you look at on the positive and negative, it you know, both expand. So basically, um, in, in this case, uh, if you uh, count, you know, the um, excess electrons, you have also ele excess electron in the positive Kx, also in the negative Kx. So basically, in the physical picture, uh, opposite spins, you know, but equal number of electrons are moving in opposite directions. Since, you know, the equal number of electrons are moving in opposite direction, if you count in terms of charge current, it cancels out. So you have zero char charge current. However, in terms of spin current, you know, opposite spin moving opposite direction, basically that will add up and then you will have a net spin current. So this um, nonlinear transport is one way to generate the pure spin current without charge current. So uh, mathematically, if you look at the derivation, uh, the yellow color represents basically the distribution function of you know, higher order, you know, second order transport. Now we apply magnetic field in this system. For example, we apply magnetic field in this direction. Then we will support you know, more spins in, in opposite direction rather than you know, along the same direction because you are uh, you know, the spin angular momentum and, uh, you know, magnetic angular momentum's uh, opposite direction. So basically, you know, you can select certain spin direction by applying magnetic field along one direction. Now, if you apply opposite direction, you only, you know, kind of promote, you know, these types of spin rather than the other. So basically you can create now imbalance in terms of the total charge, you know, moving into opposite direction. So you can have even the net charge current so this net charge current, you know, can be detected, uh, you know, once you measure basically um, the junction resistance. So this is how we can, you know, generate basically uh, second order nonlinear transport in uh, this interesting, uh, you know, um, surface state. So experimentally, we use uh, uh, bismuth selenide, which is known as uh, a topological, you know, uh, insulator supporting uh, topological surface state with a spin polarization. Okay, so then, um, you know, in order to measure this nonlinear transport, if you do very simple Taylor, uh, you know, Taylor expansion of the uh, resistance, you can have uh, uh, current independent, you know, ordinary resistance R zero. So that, you know, give rise to typical, you know, linear response in terms of voltage, V equal IR, you know, typical Ohm's law. We have the second term, which is R prime times I. And this one, you know, is basically uh, current dependent nonlinear resistance. And due to this guy, as you can see, the resistance is proportional to the current. So the voltage is proportional to I square now. So basically voltage will grow quadratically with, you know, the current. So that will be, you know, additional non-linear resistance term, uh, which will add to your voltage. So to detect this guy, we can use very simple, you know, AC harmonic uh, measurement. We uh, excite with a sinusoidal current. And then uh, if you do very simple derivation, you end up with these three terms. The first one is uh, omega term. So this is the basically ordinary resistance, R0. Okay, so that's a linear resistance you can measure. Second term is a rectified, you know, term. Okay, so it's a very clear DC term. Um, it's uh, scientifically very interesting and technologically important because, you know, from sinusoidal current or, or wave, you can convert into the DC, you know, um, uh, current or voltage. So that indicate basically this one will work as energy harvesting, you know, application. Third term, you can see sine two omega. So this is a second harmonic measurement, but if you look at the coefficient, you know, we have this R prime, uh, basically that is the 
uh, current dependent nonlinear resistance. So by just measuring the two omega term, you can get basically this uh, you know second order uh, nonlinear resistance. So we can excite uh, basically in, in that way. So um, we apply the charge current, for example, then we know, you know the supported spin direction is right angle. And then we uh, apply magnetic field along the in-plane direction and rotate. And uh, if the you know, spin and magnetic field along the same direction, basically we should have the high resistance. Huh? Uh, so that is basically coming from, you know, in this picture, right? Yeah. So as we can imagine, uh, once we apply the angle 90 degree in which our magnetic field and then, you know, supported spins uh, aligned in the same direction, we have a uh, higher resistance, as you can see in the red data. And if you apply the 270, basically H is minus Y direction, that with the supported spins uh, opposite, so we can have the minimum, you know, second harmonic resistance. On the other hand, if you look at the blue one, you know, that's the ordinary resistance, you can see 90 and 270, basically same value. So uh, we cannot distinguish, uh, you know, using an ordinary, you know, uh, linear resistance measurements. So basically this one tells us if we measure second harmonic you know, measurement and apply the magnetic field and rotate along the in-plane direction, basically we can measure in-plane spin texture. Now we can apply same thing in the outer plane. So we can apply the magnetic field in the GY you know, plane, okay, and then measure um, you know, longitudinal second harmonic voltage. And then we can see the peak happen at uh, 120 degree. So that indicate uh, 120 from the G direction. So that is basically 30 degree, you know, below from the horizontal plane. So basically that spins uh, tilted about 30 degree, you know, from the horizontal plane. So that indicate basically this K prime uh, direction in, in this particular, you know, uh, device. So you can see not only the right angle from the momentum direction, but you can also see the 30 degree downward tilting. Uh, so basically the message here is once we now apply the magnetic field along the outer plane, you know, uh, direction, we can also find out even outer plane spin texture. Uh, so by combining, you know, previous in-plane magnetic field and the next page, you know, this page of outer plane, then we can even find out, oh, you know, three-dimensional spin texture. So in fact, we can apply, you know, the current along uh, different crystalline directions. So we can make many, you know, different hole bar in one chip along the different uh, direction with respect to this uh, crystalline orientation. And then, uh, you know, uh, from the, um, supported uh, spin dependent band structure, we can expect uh, there should be threefold symmetry in terms of, you know, outer plane tilting. Uh, and uh, this is the data summarized from, you know, various uh, direction. And as you can see, we have nice uh, threefold symmetry, you know, coming from the uh, topologic insulator C3V uh, symmetry, basically. And the maximum tilting angle is, uh, you know, 30 or minus 30 degree which matches uh, very well with the RPS data. So basically, you know, um, electrical detection of uh, 3D spin texture is possible using this uh, so-called uh, uh, bilinear magnetoelectric uh, resistance measurement. Um, so we, you know, collaborate with the theorists, uh, Professor Shirley Zhang and then Giovanni, uh, and, uh, you know, using their uh, theory, uh, basically, it, it matches very well with the experimental uh, data, and uh, we can also, you know, connect the spin momentum locked uh, topological surface state with hexagonal warping is uh, responsible for our BMR observation. So now we can apply, you know, this uh, technique of BMR in uh, other interesting material systems. Uh, this is uh, basically two-dimensional electron gas. Um, at strontium titanium one on one surface. And uh, by you know, having the uh, argon uh, bombardment, you can make you know, this two dimensional electron gas at the interface. Okay. And if you look at the uh, atomic arrangement, it has a nice you know, six fold symmetry. Okay. 
um, then we want to look at, you know, what is the spin texture of this material. So we apply this uh, along the in-plane, you know, um, magnetic field rotation, and we can see it has a peak at 90 you know, degree that indicate the supported spin is, uh, you know, right angle from the uh, momentum, electron momentum direction. Um, then also this behavior is uh, linearly proportional to the current as well as magnetic field. So that's why we call this is bilinear, uh, you know, magnetoelectric uh, resistance, uh, BMR. So, which is very similar to uh, topological insulator case. Now we can apply, you know, out of plane uh, magnetic field, and then we can see from the GY scan the maximum happen at, uh, you know, for example, this one about 60 degrees. So that indicate the spin is now tilted 30 degree upward from the horizontal uh, plane. So we can basically map also. Uh, you know, along the different crystalline direction, what will be the spin texture? And uh, we also see very nice threefold, uh, you know, spin symmetry, unlike the electron symmetry of six fold. So once we summarize, uh, then, uh, you know, theoretically calculate, also we had a collaboration with the, um, you know, the Switzerland group, uh, Dr. Uh, McQueen, and uh, they calculated uh, spin texture, not only this, uh, you know, right angle along the uh, momentum direction, but at the same time, we have out of plane tilting. You can see this is the downward, upward, downward, upward, downward, upward. So basically showing, you know, matching with, uh, with our experimental data. And the maximum spin canting angle uh, is found to be about 24 degree uh, from the horizontal plane. So, you know, a lot of, People think uh, typically Lashiba system should have only you know, in-plane spin texture, but from our measurement, it indicates also simulation support. At the same time, we should have out-of-plane spin texture even in this Lashiba you know, system. And uh, STO you know, has a large dielectric constant. So by applying the backgate bias, you can tune uh, this interesting, you know, nonlinear uh, transport, and you can see, you know, we can even tune more than one order of magnitude in terms of the, you know, second harmonic uh, signal. And uh, as a function of temperature, it has a very strong correlation with, uh, you know, change of mobility. You know? So as you see, as you increase the temperature, mobility is going down, and the second harmonic, you know, uh, figure of merit also, uh, you know, goes down. So we made uh, many different samples by bombarding different doses of argon ion. Then you can modulate your samples mobility. So we try to correlate, you know, our second harmonic signal in Y axis with, uh, you know, carrier concentration. And we see a nice correlation in, in this formula in the factor, exponential factor of minus three. So uh, basically, uh, there is strong correlation with the uh, carrier density. And, uh, you know, the signal of two omega signal, second harmonic you know, nonlinear transport signal can be tuned by orders of magnitude by changing this uh, carrier concentration. Um, we can also, you know, apply this technique uh, to wire semi mirrors. Uh, tungsten ditelluride initially reported to show very large unsaturating large magnet resistance. This is the old charge effect. Uh, the region being, um, you know, like a compensated electron hole carrier density at the extremely low temperature. This material is very interesting. If you look at, you know, the atomic arrangement, depending on whether you send the electron along the A direction or B direction, we will have very different charge conductivity, about three to four times. And um, as I just mentioned, the electron hole compensation will happen as a function of temperature. And also we have very interesting spin texture. So we try to apply our BMR in these materials. And uh, we were able to see very similar 90 degree, you know, uh, basically, you know, spin momentum locking properties. And then the second harmonic signal is proportional to current and then magnetic field at the same time. So uh, this is, uh, you know, clear signature of BMR. And we also study as a function of temperature of the second harmonic resistance. And then we found there is a sign change at around 150, you know, Kelvin. Uh, so we try to understand, you know, why this one is happening. 
and uh, we try to correlate with uh, carrier concentration. And uh, this is showing the carrier concentration as a function of uh, temperature. And we try to extract the electron contribution and hole contribution. So basically this green one is electron and this uh, blue one is hole. As you can see at the low temperature, electron hell, hole, you know, uh, concentration uh, basically matches each other. So that will give a very large, you know, non-saturation MR uh, initially reported by this uh, nature paper. But as you increase temperature, you can see, um, you know, the, uh, the electron, uh, you know, concentration is going up, but the hole is actually going down. Uh, so you see, you know, large, uh, you know, sort of deviation. And that is uh, exactly what uh, has been reported by this, uh, you know, uh, uh, measurement. So you can see as you uh, increase temperature from 20 to 100 Kelvin, you can see the electron pocket grows but the whole pocket here, you know, shrink. So which match with our uh, measurement data. So we also worked with the uh, theorist, uh, Dr. Chong Han, and then uh, he found as a function of temperature, also he can see a sign change of this, uh, you know, second order transport. And uh, this can be correlated with, uh, you know, Fermi surface shape, for example, at low temperature, which is very similar to low, uh, you know, uh, Fermi level, if you cut, you know, this uh, zero energy uh, point, you can see um, the Fermi surface shape. It's like a hot shape, you can see. But if you increase temperature, which is uh, corresponding to uh, larger Fermi surface, I mean, large Fermi uh, energy, and you cut at this, uh, you know, zero, uh, uh, basically, uh, you see the Fermi surface shape is like a round shape, okay? So you can change it like, you know, from like convex and a concave shape, you know, of this Fermi shape by just shifting the uh, uh, temperature. And uh, uh, by doing um, the, the simulation, we also found as you change the temperature, you know, you can indeed uh, change the sign of this. Uh, and that highly depends on, you know, the crystalline axis. So when you, you know, inject the electron along the A direction and B direction, the behavior is very different and that uh, match with our experimental data. So uh, basically uh, we conclude uh, this uh, Fermi surface, uh, you know, convexity has a strong correlation with the BMR data, what we measure. So this gives another, you know, um, opportunity. This BMR not only can measure spin texture, but also this can measure, you know, the Fermi surface convexity. Okay, so let me move to now whole geometry. So far, you know, I showed you mostly longitudinal voltage measurement, second harmonic measurement, okay? Then we can also measure, you know, whole geometry and see what happened. So this is the data from uh, bismuth selenide 20 QL, 20 nanometer. And uh, we measure, you know, the angular dependence as a function of in-plane, you know, field. And then we see, you know, the maximum happen at uh, 180 degree, right? And uh, this is quite different from our, you know, the longitudinal measurement, because in longitudinal measurement, it should happen at 90 degrees. So there is a phase shift of about 90 degree. Once we measure the uh, the second harmonic, you know, whole data as a function of current and then magnetic field, also we see both, you know, uh, linear response. So that is uh, similar to our previous uh, BMR measurement. So we summarize those two uh, non-linear, basically, you know, plan whole measurement, and uh, that is in this uh, red one, and then the BMR is blue one. You know, so basically it's a longitudinal and whole measurement at the same time. We try to understand, uh, you know, what is the overall picture of those? This one can be explained by basically the Fermi surface uh, asymmetricity. If you have the magnetic field along the, um, you know, X direction, so that is basically, uh, you know, whole geometry, uh, you shift your, uh, you know, the Fermi surface along the Y direction, okay? So uh, you will have basically, you know, uh, a symmetric response along the Y direction. The voltage will develop along the Y direction. 
But if you now apply magnetic field along this y direction, so this is like a BMR, you know, case. Uh, you shift your Fermi surface, you know, to the x direction. You see the distortion. So uh, you can see, you know, basically a very different, uh, you know, uh, response uh, along this uh, longitudinal direction. Okay. So we summarize basically that picture here. So depending on you know, whether we apply the magnetic field uh, perpendicular to the electric field or along the electric field, uh, we will see, you know, this uh, BMR response or nonlinear planar hole response. Okay. So then uh, we did, uh, you know, again, the theory collaboration with uh, Professor Shulei Zhang and uh, Giovanni, and uh, they come up with, uh, you know, the formula and then it, it shows exactly, you know, 90 degree offset between our longitudinal BMR signal versus this uh, nonlinear planar hole signal, you can see. So theoretically it, it should be, and also more even interestingly, you can see the coefficient, the whole signal should be one third of the longitudinal signal. And experimentally we found about the coefficient, you know, uh, ratio 0 0.22. So it sort of match, you know, uh, reasonably well with the, uh, uh, proposed uh, theory. So this is our, you know, overall uh, sort of understanding about uh, basically longitudinal geometry versus whole geometry of the nonlinear uh, response. So we, in fact, we try to measure uh, this nonlinear planar hole measurement in various materials uh, like bismuth selenide, strontium titanium oxide, and uh, tungsten, you know, telluride along different crystalline direction. And then because the different device has a different geometry, we need to do, you know, some kind of normalization. And at the end, uh, we can, you know, conclude what is this uh, second harmonic, you know, resistivity. Uh, so then you can see uh, the biggest value is coming from strontium titanium oxide with uh, high, you know, mobility and uh, also quite high, you know, carrier concentration. And the tungsten ditelluride reasonably large because this one has also interesting, you know, symmetry breaking, you know, coming from the materials. Uh, so then the next question would be, is it really possible to observe this non-linear hole transport without magnetic field? So far, you know, I had to apply magnetic field perpendicular to electric field or along the electric field to see this interesting non-linear transport. But in terms of application, you know, uh, always magnetic field is not preferred in our society. So then we can, you know, envision some interesting applications. So in the whole geometry, I again, you know, write down very simple derivation of, uh, you know, this, uh, uh, you know, tail expansion using sinusoidal input. Then you can see the first one is basically V omega, you know, linear resistance term. Second one is the DC term, which is the electrification term. So as I mentioned before, this one can be applied for energy harvesting application. The last term is the second omega term. So basically this is a second harmonic generation or sometimes, you know, you can call as a frequency doubling. Uh, as, as if, you know, you can see in the green, our laser pointer application. So the first prediction uh, in theory happened in 2015 um, by a few papers. So then they described this uh, non-linear hole effect. So uh, this is without magnetic field now, can be induced if there is, you know, very curvature dipole, BCD. Then experimentally, uh, two group uh, independently reported in 2019 uh, the observation of this nonlinear hole effect without magnetic field under time reversal symmetry because there is no magnetic field uh, at uh, using this material tungsten ditelluride bilayer or few layers. In both paper described, you know, the origin as the BCD, you know, uh, very curvature dipole, and the maximum temperature they can observe this second harmonic signal is up to 100 Kelvin in in both cases. So uh, still, you know, the application of this behavior for, you know, at room temperature uh, is not possible. So we try to, you know, measure some other interesting materials. Uh, then uh, we, you know, end up with this uh, tantalum iridium uh, telluride. 
this material also, you know, has a broken, uh, you know, symmetry in terms of uh, atomic arrangement. So you can see along the A and B direction, you will have very different uh, response of, you know, even charge conductivity. But this material is known as example of like uh, wire semi metals, you know, hydrogen atom because it support the minimum uh, wire node. Okay, so it's a kind of simplest example of uh, wire semi metal. So we we kind of thought, you know, then the behavior should be even stronger because the structure is uh, simpler. So um, we found uh, this. Um, uh, Nonlinear Hall effect without any magnetic field can sustain even up to room temperature, as you can see. Also, there is a sign change, and the behavior is very strong even at room temperature. Coming, you know, as you can see from this red data, and uh, then we can, you know, um, if there is a two omega signal, okay, then basically, you know, DC term coefficient should be exactly same as two omega signal. So there should be strong electrification. So then we shine basically our Wi-Fi, you know, um, basically, you know, the, uh, um, you know, irritation. It's a wireless signal, you know, coming from antenna basically. Then we try to measure um, the electrified DC in, in the uh, whole geometry. Okay, so electric field oscillate along this direction basically, and we measure the voltage along this direction. So then we see the maximum response of this around 2.3 you know, to 2.4 gigahertz. So basically we demonstrate, uh, you know, wireless RF electrification with the zero external bias and with zero magnetic field. Uh, so uh, we hope, you know, this can promote uh, some possible application room temperature, uh, non-linear hot effect. Uh, The next question uh, would be, you know, whether we can measure this non-linear in you know, Hall effect without magnetic field in other, you know, topology materials like uh, bismuth selenide, for example. So we uh, try to measure those, and we found uh, also, you know, quite uh, reasonably good signal uh, up to even room temperature or so. Uh, but this, you know, crystal symmetry is a C3V symmetry, okay? So if you do, you know, simple, this uh, very curvature dipole calculation, it should be zero. So basically this uh, BCD, you know, cannot support the observation of this uh, non-linear Hall effect. So at the end, uh, you know, we distributed, I mean, uh, we spent some time to look at what would be the possible origin and we concluded with the collaboration with uh, Liang Fu in MIT. Uh, it, it should be, you know, skew scattering originated, you know, nonlinear Hall effect. So this is kind of first demonstration of the extrinsic, you know, nonlinear Hall effect without, uh, you know, very curvature, you know, argument. All right. So I, I hope, you know, the effort can continue and then look at, you know, various other materials and what would be, you know, uh, the possibility look at this nonlinear response because uh, this you know, not only to measure, you know, uh, basically spin texture using this nonlinear transport. Uh, we can also see, you know, dark Fermi surface uh, shape and uh, distortion using this nonlinear response. But at the end, as I show you, you know, this is even applicable, some energy harvesting application or, you know, frequency doubling applications. So for this, I want to thank uh, many of my uh, collaborators who mainly supported, you know, all kind of interesting theory uh, collaboration. And the data I show you today, mostly obtained by, uh, you know, Dr. He Pan, Pan he. now he's a professor in the Fudan University, and also Dr. Dusha Kuma, uh, who did very interesting also study about the uh, tantalum iridium TE4. Okay, thank you very much for your attention. Yeah, I'm happy to get any question. Yeah, thank you so much, Unsu, uh, for this wonderful lecture summarizing the recent developments. Uh, really, very really nice overview. Uh, so uh, we have uh, some time for questions, and I take the first question from Mr. Puspendra Gupta. So his, his, uh, his question is, uh, what is the role of the uh, NGO layer in the nonlinear panel Hall effect? Okay. Yeah, so it's a good question. Okay, so there is no role of the MGO aluminum oxide. This is just to protect our you know surface from the 
you know, from the environment, okay? So there is no role because when you send your electron, basically we etch out this uh, layer and we make a contact on top of bismuth selenide directly, all right? So this is just our capping layer, okay? No special role. Okay, uh, thank you. Um, Sobhik, uh, please ask your question. Hi, uh, yeah, this is Shobhik. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Oh, great. Uh, so yeah, it's a great talk. I had just uh, two quick questions. So one about the tantalum iridium tellurium four work, the wild, uh, so which you say this is an ideal uh, wild material. Mm. Um, so I was just wondering, are there uh, other investigations which see whether it has how many wild nodes or why the formula will generally lie in your sample uh, and whether there is any change as a function of temperature, because I think you also showed there's some change in the sign of your nonlinear voltage. Sure. I think there is a report about the band structure, you know, calculation. Okay. Uh, so if you look at our reference of this paper, I think you can find, you know, a couple of related references, uh, which discussed uh, about the, you know, the materials aspect of this, and then even, you know, proposes uh, like hydrogen atom example of wild semi-metals. I see. I see. Okay. okay. Yeah. So please refer to our, you know, reference uh, in this paper. Okay. Okay. So I have also a quick second question. So sure. about the uh, like the last part of the work. So is there a definitive way to separate out the intrinsic versus extrinsic uh, nonlinear uh, Hall effect? So basically, intrinsic you know should come from the band structure. So that's why uh, intrinsic should be connected with the very curvature. But this material, uh, because of this uh, symmetry, um, there shouldn't be any you know very curvature dipole. Uh, which is kind of well known. So then uh, by measuring, you know, the some of the detail um, sort of analysis, like a skew scattering, you know, uh, it, it should be proportional to, you know, certain, uh, you know, parameter, like, uh, uh, you know, um, the time constant square, you know, uh, or, or, you know, how you connect those with the mobility and so on. So by doing some analysis at the end, uh, you can attribute, you know, uh, you know, what will be the real origin. Think, so yeah. That's why, yeah, we can, we can attribute it, you know, as an extrinsic uh, effect in this case. Okay. okay. Um, my question was more on the, like the experimental side. I mean, I understand uh, that in the, this case, business selenide, you can't have uh, this uh, intrinsic effect. But then, uh -huh. uh, like uh, in the other, uh, in the earlier, which has been originally attributed to the very curvature dipole, uh -huh. uh, is there a possibility that there could be some extrinsic uh, mechanisms also contributing to the effect that they see? And is it easy to distinguish the two? That's yeah, so it's a very good question. I think uh, it's probably certainly possible. Um, so let me share with you. Uh, to share a different screen. So this is our paper recently published about this uh, bismuth, uh, you know, cellulite. And uh, we can, you know, do the fitting of the, our, you know, like second harmonic signal as a function of, uh, you know, conductivity square, for example, you know, from many different samples. Uh, so then we can fit with the skew scattering, you know, formula, for example. And uh, um, the, the intercept of the y-axis, for example, and the slope, you know, has basically, you know, different meaning in terms of, you know, our theory uh, support. So basically we can even also extract, uh, you know, what is the contribution, you know, from the skew or even side jump and so on. So, because the first paper, you know, didn't do uh, these types of, uh, you know, uh, analysis, right? So I think certainly possible, maybe there could be some kind of, you know, contribution from the extrinsic origin. Uh, if you look at, you know, even the first paper, I, I think it's certainly possible, but, you know, uh, it's just started only, only a few papers. Uh, sure, yeah. So, you know, I think follow up work will reveal huh, some, some more details, uh, I think in the future. Oh, great, thank you. Thank you. Uh, I just have a follow up question, Hunsu, uh, about that. On slide 36, you saw this uh, sign change. So, what mm -hmm. is the origin behind the sign change that when you go towards higher temperature, mm -hmm. 
Uh, yeah, it's a very good question. Yeah, probably I didn't explain well. So this one is very similar to what we observed uh, in this, uh, uh, you know, tungsten dihydride, for example. So if you look at our second harmonic signal here, you know, it changed also sign at around 150 uh, Kelvin. So um, um, this is basically coming from the shift of the you know Fermi surface. At uh, low temperature, our Fermi surface is here, okay? So the, you can see the electron and hole concentration almost similar. If we increase now temperature, the Fermi you know, level also increase. So in intermediate temperature, you can see now the Fermi surface, you know, the Fermi energy increase. So the hole density is now you know, almost you know, negligible, but the electron sort of you know, density increase. So basically electron and hole number changes and then you know, that can induce uh, basically the sign change eventually. So that is uh, what we you know, concluded. And then also we attributed a very similar uh, you know, explanation uh, for the sign change we see even in these uh, uh, materials. Okay, so these, uh, these effects, do you also expect to be observed in the uh, dichalcogenides like MOS2 or, or other families? Okay, so it's uh, so another very good question. Um, so this uh, effect, only happens when there is uh, symmetry, you know, breaking, all right? So for example, if you look at this, uh, you know, in terms of electrons perspective, huh, if the electron moves along this B direction here, can you see my uh, cursor Which yes. here, like this? Then uh, let's assume you are like, a, as if you are an electron and you look at your left side and right side and it's a symmetric. All right, so this electron will move straight because left potential and right side potential equal. Now you move your electron along the A direction, okay? So, you know, my laser pointer is the electron, it's moving in this way. Then you look at your left side and right side is very asymmetric, the potential is different. So basically the whole plane is, you know, tilted in, in one side. So this electron will kind of, you know, move along the one side as you move forward. All right. When you come back, this electron is now opposite side. What happened? Because the whole potential is tilted along the same direction, this electron will keep drifting in one side like this. So this is why you can break the you know time reversal symmetry in this material without any magnetic field. So this is the region why we can see uh, basically this uh, nonlinear transport at zero magnetic field. So in fact, we measured. We try to measure in, uh, you know, uh, in various other materials. Uh, MOS2, we don't see any effect because the, there is no such a crystal symmetry breaking in those materials. Graphene, we cannot see. Conventional, you know, heavy metals like platinum, tantalum, there is no such effect. Okay, so you have to have this interesting symmetry breaking, you know, uh, like as if like, uh, you know, uh, time reversal symmetry breaking by sort of, you know, crystal uh, field. So that is required. Okay, thank you. Uh, there are other questions. Uh, Aswin, uh, please go ahead with your question. Uh, so my question is that when you are measuring nonlinear effect, uh, is there any effect of the joule heat that you need to consider? Sure, I mean, any electrical measurement, you always, uh, you know, has, uh, you know, thermal effect. Huh? Uh, so basically, you know, what we can do is uh, uh, you can look at um, like um, the angular dependence along different crystal line direction, for example, this. So uh, when we apply, you know, our signal, our current along the K is here versus this is a K prime, uh, you know, or we can send to, you know, uh, um, you know, M direction, which is along this, this direction. As you can see, uh, once we send our electron along this M direction, basically, you know, some signal is almost zero or negligible. But on the other hand, if you send along the different crystalline direction, you can see, uh, you know, quite a good signal, but with the opposite, you know, um, uh, 
uh, you know, more the magnitude uh, when you send the uh, different crystalline trace. So basically that indicate, uh, basically there is no, you know, thermal effect uh, in this measurement, at least, because uh, thermal effect, you know, uh, will not distinguish when you send your electrons along, you know, spatial crystalline, you know, direction. So this is one way uh, you can rule out, you know, whether, there is a thermal contribution in our signal. But of course, if you do the measurement, we see, uh, you know, the whole resistance sometimes, you know, shift up because of heating. Uh, but, but that effect doesn't have the, you know, symmetry as we expected. So you can always take it out, you know, from your uh, low data once you do the control measurement. Yeah, okay, thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Aswin. Uh, Corpona has a question. Can a GN Faraday rotation effect be observed in such topological materials and how it could be? Giant Faraday rotation, I think it's uh, possible. Actually, um, let me share you some other one. So basically this is probably everybody knows huh? and the, you know, this is basically Faraday rotation measurement in gallium arsenide by David Ashulam group in Santa Barbara in 2004 using gallium arsenide, okay? So uh, actually we developed a new technique called scanning vol you know, photovoltage microscope with the current. Uh, basically you apply the current and you know spin accumulation happen in a heavy, you know, uh, spin of a couple of elements. Uh, then we shine circular polarized light. Uh, and then we can use in you know, a right hand and left hand and subtract. So uh, by doing this, basically it's very similar to, you know, like, um, you know, Faraday rotation uh, in, in a way. Yeah? Uh, but of course the detail mechanism, you know, slightly different. This is uh, basically due to the uh, magnetic circular dichroism. Uh, but anyhow, we can see, uh, you know, very clear spin accumulation in the channel even in a, in a metallic you know, sample like a platinum. Uh, this is the top view. Uh, this is a, you know, channel edges. You can see in left and right side, you have a different you know, uh, polarity of spin accumulation. Once you flip your charge current, uh, you can see you know, left and right side you know, change colors compared to this guy. So basically the spin accumulation direction you know, flip huh, depending on the charge current. Then this is a, a bismuth alunite and you can see uh, you know, blue and reddish, but once you change your charge current, you can see red and bluish. So you can, you know, really change um, the direction. So basically, um, I think it is possible, uh, but using the magnetic optical curve or magnetic, you know, this uh, Faraday rotation, uh, in our lab, we tried, you know, this is a mock measurement imaging, and we don't see any uh, clear evidence of spin accumulation. But however, the, our new technique called this, uh, you know, photo uh, voltage mapping, you can see very clear spin accumulation depending on the charge current direction. Uh, so I think in principle, it is possible, and, but it's very controversial. You can see those two papers here, uh, you know, uh, concluded uh, you can measure using basically Mock or Faraday rotation, this spin accumulation. But the other two paper, you know, uh, concluded is not suitable in measuring. So I think it's very controversial. Perhaps it's due to the sensitivity of the, you know, measurement setup. But at least in my lab, uh, I think photo current measurement is better than, the, you know, uh, Faraday rotation or Mock measurements. So that's our conclusion. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, I think uh, Pushpendra has still doubt about this uh, MGO capping because you have uh, used MGO and aluminum oxide. So he's asking, is there any special reason to use two capping layers? There's no reason actually. You can just use only one, no problem. But this is our, you know, like, um, you know, typical capping procedure in any samples huh? when we, which we developed in, uh, when you work with a metallic sample. So for example, when you have, uh, you know, like uh, uh, platinum, cobalt and boron, uh, we typically cap with, uh, you know, MGO and uh, 
aluminum oxide. The region of MGO, you can always increase uh, the perpendicular you know, magnetic anisotropy of this uh, very thin uh, cobalt ion boron. And then MGO is uh, basically the absorbed water, okay? So MGO shouldn't be used as the final capping layer. So that's why we put aluminum oxide on top because aluminum oxide is very stable capping against, you know, the environmental sort of, you know, uh, doping and decay. So this is our just uh, common practice. So, you know, it's a habit huh, in, in my group. Capping should be something like this. So no matter what they do, they just uh, automatically use. Huh? <laughs> and uh, there's no special region. Yeah. All right. So I do not see more questions. So I think uh, it was a wonderful overview of this new phenomena. Uh, I'm really thankful to you, Hunsu, for this wonderful lecture. And uh, there, there was a large number of participants, about 60 people attended today. So it's really good. And uh, I think uh, we will have more chances of interacting. Uh, if you have further questions, I'm sure you can write to Professor Hun Su Yang and you will reply there. But with, yeah. this, uh, uh, with this, I think we, uh, today we can close it. And next week, we can have uh, at the same time uh, the lecture by Professor Eric Fullerton. So, uh, Unsu, if you are free, you are also welcome to join the lecture. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much for this, you know, organization. And then, uh, you know, I wish all the success for your, you know, uh, experiment and uh, yes. also theory. Yeah. And uh, you. hope to see you, you know, in the future in person uh, after yes. all this uh, pandemic is over. Yes. And we are also working on uh, this muscle and I. Uh, I will send you some papers and uh, let's hope that we can uh, discuss something. Yeah, sure. thank you so much again and thank you so much all the participants for joining and making it a success. So with this, uh, I close the session today and uh, please be uh, safe and stay healthy. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Yeah,